Okay, let's uh, let's pray. Let's just commit ourselves to God. Yes. Let's ask Him to speak to us this morning. Yeah, when as we draw near to Him, the Word of God declares that He will draw near to us. And so, this morning, let's um, let's just ask Him to speak to us, speak to our hearts, speak to us, reveal something of Himself to us. Right. Yeah, just go ahead in your own words, in your own language. Just ask the Lord, say, Lord, I just want to see you, hear you, know you, Lord. Lord, I just come in your presence, draw near to you, Father God. I pray that you would speak. I pray that you would reveal. I pray that you would quicken your word. I just go ahead, just pray, just ask the Lord. Just ask the Lord to put a strong desire for more of him. Ask the Lord to put a, you know, a zeal, a hunger for more of His Word, for more of the work of His Spirit. Just ask the Lord. The Lord knows where we are right now in the sense of where we stand in our relationship with Him. The Lord knows and the Lord is willing to you know, strengthen us, encourage us, empower us to be all that He wants us to be, to become all that He wants us to become. And so the best thing that we can do is to you know, yield ourselves to Him, surrender ourselves to Him. And He is willing and He is able to, to do that in our lives. Okay, Maybe you know, those of us who can pray in tongues, you can go ahead and pray in tongues just between you and the Lord so that you can hear yourself you know, just continue to just pray intensely sincerely yes we bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Father the God, this morning we want to thank you because your grace is sufficient for us, Lord. Your grace is sufficient for us. You know, whatever difficulty, challenge that you can think of, his grace is sufficient for us. You know, whatever mountain that seems immovable, well, his grace is sufficient for us. His grace is sufficient for us to endure and to overcome. Endure and to overcome. Right? Endure means to go through patiently, to persevere. And His grace is sufficient for that. His grace is also sufficient for us to overcome, to be overcomers, to rise up, to reign above, to circumvent, to move through. His grace is sufficient. So let's just thank Him for the grace of God. And this also, just receive that empowering grace in our lives. Come Holy Spirit, have your way, Lord. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Lord, we just need your grace and mercy. Lord, your word says, the Lord, that we can draw near with boldness. Lord, to your very room, of very throne, O oh Father God, to receive grace. Yes, Father God, so we draw near boldly, God. We draw near boldly, with all courage, with all boldness. With not withholding, O oh God, not condemned, O oh God. Yes, <clears throat> not, oh God, defeated, but Lord, we, we, we raise up, we rise up, we keep our eyes on you, and we draw near with boldness, God, because you see us through the shed blood of Christ. You see us, O oh God, as those who are made the right, who have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, you see us as those who are justified, O oh Father God, and so we draw near to, with boldness. O oh God, to receive grace, O oh Master, that empowering grace in our lives, Father God, strengthening us in our inner man, refreshing us in our inner man. 
Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. We thank you for the change in desire, for the change in heart, oh God, even that, that is coming upon us right now. We thank you for the, the change in our thoughts and imaginations that are coming over us right now, Father God. We thank you, Master. Yes, Lord, wash over us with the water of your word this morning, Father God. Cleanse us, refresh us, strengthen us, Lord. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your favor. Yes, Master, we give you all the praise and all the glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so... Um, okay, so we've been studying about, um, you know, uh, about corporate worship, personal worship, right? The last class. So we've been looking at that. And today... Uh, we will look at another aspect of worship that which is um, which the bible talks about and um, and this is also you know to enrich us um, personally and also to um, corporately also you know as we as we move uh, as we gather together and worship um, the lord also enables us to uh, you know he has he has actually ordained this for us so let's look at that and we are looking at chapter 9 and which is about uh, prophetic worship moving prophetically in praise and worship okay so yeah um let me just share the notes here okay Okay, so just want to before we get into this, we just want I just want to remind us that we have a in-depth course on the prophetic, right? On the apostolic, prophetic, the pastoral, evangelist, teacher. So we have in-depth courses or subjects um, during the course of you know uh, next year, I think. So you have that, or, or maybe even the uh, I think it's the second year. So that's a very in-depth study on the prophetic. Okay, so what we are looking at is an overview of you know, uh, one aspect of the prophetic, which is prophetic worship. Okay, so when we say prophecy, right? So what does that remind you of when you say prophecy or uh, prophetic? Um, what what are you remind? What picture comes to your mind? Prophecy, prophet, God talking to man, man talking to man. As a result of that, right? God talking to man through man. Right, so, um, so we see that it's actually an inspired utterance, right? and the inspiration coming from the Holy Spirit. Right, so God uh, uh, inspiring us, or stirring us, or putting His words in us, and as a result of us of that, we re either release His word or do His word, meaning we obey. Right, um, so God might ask us to do something, and it's we we see that. You know, that's as a result of prophecy. So God speaking to man through man would be a very simple understanding of what prophet, prophecy is. Okay, So um, to get some clarity about what prophecy is, before we get into, you know, uh, the prophetic and worship, uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse, uh, uh, a few verses there. 1 Corinthians 14, I think it's verse um, 4, I think. Okay, just one second. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3 says, He who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to man. Okay, so he prophesies. So it's talking about someone who is prophesying, and uh, that prophesying results in three things. You know, the simple gift of prophecy. The, the prophesying results in three things. What are those things mentioned there? He who prophesies speaks what? Edification. Okay, that's the first thing. He who prophesies speaks edification. So edification is to build up. Okay, when we, uh, an old English word for building is edifice or any structure. You know, so you're saying edification is means which means to build up. Okay, or it could also mean um, progress. It could means constructive spiritual progress. Right. So when there is prophecy. It builds up a person. It builds up a person in the 
spirit. Okay, so first thing, prophecy, he who prophesies speaks edification, it builds up a person, right? So we know, you know, prophecy, when we think of prophecy, it, it, it could be about somebody's future, right? Somebody's future, okay, this is what God wants you to be, or this is what God is saying, right? So it builds up the person, right? It, uh, maybe that person is feeling very discouraged, maybe the person has lost all hope, but then here comes the prophecy saying, you know, um, don't fear, I am with you. I will take care of things. I'll take care of you know the very situation that you are you know facing. I will take care of it. It brings a lot of hope. It brings edification. It bring it builds up a person in the inner man. Okay, so edification. The second word. What is it used there? Edification. What is the second word there? Exhort. Verse three, right? Exhortation. What does exhortation mean? It means to declare. It means to again. Encourage, right? You when you exhort someone, it means to encourage someone with the word of God, right? So it brings exhortation, it bring, brings uh, encouragement, right? So many times, when when people have, you know, like we see in, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in the Old Testament where the kings go and meet with Elisha, right? They ask Elisha, you know, we want a word from the Lord because all these Moabite uh, kings, they are all, you know. Uh, surrounding, they are coming to battle. So then they ask him, you know, is there a word from the Lord? Right. So, Josh, I mean, Elisha, he asks for a musician, and then he 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 releases the word. Says, "Thus says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You do this, and you know, the the Lord will the Lord, victory is yours, and so on." So that greatly encouraged them. You know, they went discouraged. They went with fear, but. This prophetic word encouraged them, right? So prophecy brings encouragement, exhortation. What is the third one? Comfort. What is comfort? Consolation, right? So uh, you are troubled. The prophetic word comforts us, right? Because it comes from God, and it comes uh, from Him who knows our heart, who knows our situation, right? So it's so apt. It it's like something hitting the target. Right, it's right on point, hits the target. So, the prophetic word is like that because it, God knows the hearts of people, God knows the mind of people, and God speaks and it brings exhortation uh, to man, edification, exhortation, and comfort. So, it brings a lot of comfort. Okay, and uh, you know, verse four also says, He who prophesies edifies the church, which means the whole church, which means the people of God. They get edified. They get built up whenever there is a prophetic uh, word, you know, prophetic ministry. Okay, so what is that connection with worship? Okay, so that is what we are exploring. You know, what does prophecy got to do with worship? Okay, so when we look at uh, when we look at the Old Testament, when we see um, uh, you know the, the way worship it was um, uh, done in the tabernacle, specifically in the tabernacle of David, we see that all these things coming together. We see music. We see prophecy, we see worship, all these three th elements coming together in the kind of worship that happened in the tabernacle, right? So let's look at, uh, you know, the, the psalmist, um, several scriptures that he mentions, right? He, he mentions about music, we know that. Psalm 49, 149, sorry, verse 3, let them praise his name with the dance, let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. Psalm 150, you know, it's full of uh, uh, a list of, um, a list of instruments and uh, you know uh, how we need to praise him with the sound of that. So we see that okay, music we know is integral to praise and worship, right? It's it accompanies uh, our praise of God, accompanied to the worship of God, right? So we also see that there is a connection between music and the prophetic. Okay, so that is what we were looking at, right? First Samuel chapter ten is one example where. Samuel is prophesying to King Saul. He's not yet king, but he tells him that. He says, no, you shall come down, 1 Samuel 10 and verse 5, right? You shall come down to the hill of God. I'm sorry, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, 
and they will be prophesying. Okay, so they're all these are all prophets. They're all playing the musical instrument instruments, several kinds of musical instruments. And Samuel says, you know, and they will be prophesying. They will be playing this instrument. They will be prophesying. So we see, see that you know, this this prophets are there. They are playing these instruments, and they are prophesying. Okay, another example that the one that we just looked at, Second Kings three. Okay, Second Kings three verses fourteen to sixteen, and so. Uh, king Jehoshaphat is there, king of Judah. He's right in front of this prophet Elisha, right? So they go and ask a word of the Lord. So Elisha speaks to them and he says, uh, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. Okay. Then he goes on to give some instruction. Verse 15 says, Now bring, bring me a musician. Okay. Bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Okay. Thus says the Lord. So you see the sequence. He asks for a musician. The musician comes to play. And it's something that we notice here. What happens when the musician plays? Look at the verse. Just look into the verse. What happens when the musician plays? Okay. And the hand of the Lord came upon him. Okay, what is the hand of the Lord? The hand of the Lord is the hand of the Lord. <laughs> right? It just means that he experienced the presence of God. He experienced the touch of God. Right? He experienced the, the presence of God, the touch of God. So it says the hand of the Lord. You know, many times we see in Scripture, the word of the Lord came to him, which means that he received a prophetic word. The word of the Lord came to the prophet. The hand of the Lord came upon, which means the presence, the touch, the power of God. So he experienced the touch of God. right? So the hand of the Lord came upon him, came upon him, meaning Elisha. Then what does Elisha do? Yeah, so he releases a word which accompanied the presence of God, and He tells them, you know, let's let's look at Second um, Kings three, Second um, Kings three, and let's look at verses following that also. Right? He says, um, "Make this valley full of ditches." Okay, that's the first instruction, and then He says, "For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley will be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink." And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hands. So they went for this very reason. They wanted to hear what will happen to us. Right Now these Moabites are gathered against us. They are many in number. What will happen to us? Right. So those days, whenever they wanted to hear from God, they would go to the prophet. They would go to the prophet. The prophet would have the word of the Lord. The prophet would interact with God, commune with God, and release that word. So they did the right thing. right? They went, they asked. So the prophet says, as he experiences the hand of the Lord, he says, thus says the Lord. Okay. This is what the Lord says. So he's received into his heart uh, what the Lord wants to be done, what the Lord is saying, and he's faithful to communicate that right to them. Okay, so we see that. And... What is interesting is that before prophesying, and well, he didn't do it every time, but this particular time he said, bring me a musician. Now we don't know what musician, what instrument, and what kind of music he played, but we know that there is a connection between the prophetic or the anointing, which is the, prayer, which is the power and presence of God, and music. Right, so which means if someone who is, you know, who's playing something that's edifying, you know, can we express that? Can we do that? Yes, we can. Right? we can we can express our heart through music, and if we are doing that, and if if the music that we are playing is edifying, and if it's you know if it's a, as offered up as a worship to God, well, there's something that's changing. We are experiencing the presence and the power of God. Okay? Uh, we are making ourselves sensitive and aware of the presence and power of God. 
You can also say, well, there is a there is a drawing that's happening. There's an invitation to experience the presence and power of God. Right. So we see that it's it's powerful, right? So there is a connection. And so um, music, the prophetic, and the worship comes together when we look at the tabernacle of David. Okay. The tabernacle, the, the kind of worship that happened in the tabernacle, we see that, yes, there is all these aspects happening. Okay. Um, you know, there is the background to this tabernacle and how David built the tabernacle. We know that the Ark of the Covenant, you know, during this prophet Samuel's time, his, his sons were there, uh, you know, Hophni and uh, Eli, Eli's sons, the, the two sons who were there, they were actually sinning before God. Right? They would sin openly, brazenly before God, and God was very displeased with them. And at that time, the Philistines would come and have, you know, they, they came in battle against the people. And so they took the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, they said, okay, this Ark of the Covenant represents God, represents the power of God. So I'm going to take this Ark into battle. You know, that can be our weapon, and uh, we would see what happens. Right? So they did that. They took the Ark of the Covenant, but the Israelites were defeated because God had you know, left them. He had defeated he, because they were sinning openly. And so Israel was defeated. First Samuel 4 and verse um, uh, 4 says, Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. Verse 11, also the Ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they died. Okay, So the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines, and they took this ark, which is basically, you know, we, we read about it, uh, you know, how it was, uh, it had the mercy seat on top, and so on, and all the instruction, how it should be constructed, God had given. So it was taken by the Philistines uh, into their land. Okay. And it was with them for many years. Actually, they moved it from city to city for seven months, because wherever they took it, some terrible things happened there, right? So they first put it in the temple of their god, Dagon, and they kept it overnight. In the morning, they came and they saw this huge idol of that deity face down, fallen down, broken. Right? Right? No one would dare do that. No one could possibly do that. But then the power of God did that. And then we see several things happening. But anyway, they got fed up and they said, we don't want this. Because wherever we take it, you know, there is there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, you know, these kind of things happening. So let's just 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 give it back, right? So they put it there. They um, they keep it in this place. Um, they return to. They didn't know how to handle the ark, right? So so then David decides that he needs to bring the ark back. Okay. He decides to bring the ark back to um, back to Jerusalem, and uh, so he brings it back. And he, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen from the time it is brought, and how it is brought, and so on. But he brings it back, and he puts a huge tent around it, and he begins this worship, right? this worship of God, because he realizes that hey, this ark, not only does it represent the power of God, but the power of God is made manifest wherever the ark is. And so he begins to you know, worship and minister and so on. Okay, so this is what we see, First Chronicles 16. Okay, when you go to First Chronicles 16, verse 1, it says, So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. Okay. Verses 4 to 6. And he, David, appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. And then he writes about who were those people, the musicians and so on. You know, it writes the names of those, Asaf and, and so on. And he also you know, writes about some instruments which were used stringed instruments, harps, music with cymbals, and so on. Trumpets are mentioned there. And these were used before the Ark of the Covenant. For the first time, they actually did that. right? So this, it, this tabernacle of God, or David, 
became to be known as the Davidic order of worship. So this continued. You know, during David's reign, it continued. There were other kings who also had the same kind of instituted, they followed through with this Davidic order of worship. They also followed through. Right? They also did the same thing when they were ruling and reigning. Okay. Let's look at uh, First Chronicles 25. It gives more information about you know what happened and how it happened and who were the people, how many were there, etc. Right? First Chronicles 25 verses 1 to 8. Okay, it says, Moreover, David and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Esaph, Heman, Jeduthun, who should prophesy with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. Okay, and the number of skilled men performing their service was, and then it goes on to list them, and it says, um, uh, you know, again, it says in verse, uh, I think, 3, it says, Jeduthun, who prophesied with a harp to give thanks and to praise the Lord, and so on. Okay, and, uh, and in verse 7, it says, The number of them with their brethren who were instructed in the songs of the Lord, all who were skillful, was 288. And they cast lots for the duty, the small as, as well as the great, the teacher, as well as the student. So, so if we read that, they would prophesy with these instruments. So prophecy was taking place. There was worship that was taking place. There were songs that were being sung in, in as an offering to God. All this was happening. Okay. So when we look at that passage, we see that there were 288 singers who sang prophetic songs, 4,000 musicians who ministered in worship. And this worship happened every day, every hour. And they would cast lots, meaning Okay, who will take care of worship from, let's say, 10 to 12? 12 to 2, who would do it? So it was a continuous thing, which, which continued nonstop every year. Okay, so this is something that David instituted, installed. Okay, and much later, in the book of Acts, when the disciples were gathered together, James, he mentions this. He says that... Um, the, the Lord, he says, I will, you know, in verse, uh, Acts 15 and verse 16, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of, tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. So what do we see? What do we understand from this? First, we understand when we look at the tabernacle of David, we see what is happening, the kind of worship that was happening. We see that there was music, we see that there were singers, but we also see one important aspect, which is prophetic in nature. Okay, so, so what do we understand from prophecy? It is God actually giving the words and God inspiring the people to speak forth what is in his heart for the people, right? To speak forth, to declare what is in his heart, or maybe it could be instruction, maybe he's bringing you know, encouragement, he's bringing uh, edification, we saw, saw that. Maybe he's bringing correction even. Right, correction, maybe it's a warning. So to speak forth, to declare to people what's in his heart. Right. So in the act of worship, as people were worshiping God, as people were singing these songs of worship, in adoration of God, in declaration of who God was and what he did and so on, in the same way they were receiving from God, from the Spirit of God, these prophetic utterances, these prophetic songs, to the people, these prophetic songs about God. Okay, so that is something that we see here. And Acts chapter fifteen says that Lord is rebuilding that tabernacle, meaning meaning that He's bringing back that aspect of worship, which is prophetic worship. Okay, so what is prophecy, and how does the Holy Spirit? bring the prophetic word to our hearts. You know, that's important, right? So we can look at it in two ways, you know, in, in, from the perspective of someone who is leading in worship. And therefore, you know, since this is something that the Lord is bringing back, which is scriptural, which, is re, which the Lord is reinstating to the body, to the church, so we know that we can actually flow in it. It is possible. It is for us. And we can desire it. Right? And we, it brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. Right? So it, 
we look at it from the perspective of someone who is leading worship. Okay, one who is leading worship, one who is facilitating, one who is being a lead worshiper. In other words, and we can also look at it from those who are worshiping and those who are being led in worship. Or maybe we can even look at it from the perspective of a personal worship, just time alone with God when I'm worshiping, or from the perspective of corporate worship. Right? So in all these settings, prophetic worship is applicable. Right? Though we see it in the tabernacle, which was more of a corporate thing, but we see that it is it, it is applicable you know when we look at how prophecy works okay any questions here before we move on okay so question is um, so is prophetic worship only for a select few or for all okay but aren't only prophets who prophesy so if it does it mean all our prophets? Yes? Okay, so how can we say, okay, so are we, are we clear? And not everyone is a prophet, right? Because Ephesians 4.11 talks about some are called to be prophets, some are called to be apostles, um, pastors, evangelists, teachers, pastors, and so on, right? So prophets. So some are called into that office or ministry, office of prophet. But how can we say for sure that all can prophesy? God can talk to anyone. But what if it is God's will that he talks to some? How can we know for sure that all can prophesy? Yeah, all you know, all can believe in God. All can read the scriptures, but how can we sh be sure that all can prophesy? We need to be sure, right? We need. We should not have any doubts. We need to have that clarity. But how can we say that? Any idea? Huh? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Prophecy is a gift, okay. But is it a gift for all? So how can we know for sure? Okay. Okay, somebody said something here online. Yeah, um, so what are we saying? First Corinthians 14 and 31, okay. So what does it say? It says, for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Okay, this is a very direct verse. It says that, yeah, he's talking about prophecy. He's talking about how prophecy should be used in church, right? So he's talking about the fact that, hey, if there are two or three people who prophesy, he's talking about prophets, actually. Let two of them speak and let the others listen, let the others judge, right? And so on. Then he goes on to say, you can all prophesy that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Okay. So why would he say all can prophesy if we don't have an ability or if God's, it is not God's will? right? And there are several other verses also. For example, if you look at um, 1 Corinthians 14 again, the first verse, what does it say? Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts so we see prophecy as one of the gifts right desire spiritual gifts which means all many right gifts is many just not one so he's saying desire spiritual gifts why should i desire spiritual gifts the whole list if it was not god's intention and design that i could prophesy right desire spiritual gifts so he says that, look at the second part of the verse. Pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So he's saying you desire this, you pursue this, especially that you may prophesy. So again, what is prophecy? It is edification. It is God speaking to man, 
It is, you know, speaking edification, exhortation, and comfort. So God puts a word, and God releases a word to our hearts, and it brings, when we speak it out, or when we act it out, when we obey, it brings edification, exhortation, and comfort to man. Okay, so that's a simple part of it. Yes, there are other degrees to the prophetic, meaning it could be correction, it could be directional, it could be foretelling of future, it has a futuristic element to it. All that is also part of prophecy. right? But at the basic, simple level, for all believers, it is God speaking and bringing edification, exhortation, and comfort to all. Yeah. Yeah, exhortation, edification. <laughs> okay, so the question is, okay, prophecy, prophecy <coughs> brings edification, exhortation, comfort to man. But when we look at some of the prophetic books, especially you know, Jeremiah, uh, there's nothing edifying there is what I'm saying. Okay, well, if you look at actually Jeremiah, the first chapter itself, so this is what the Lord says, you know, you will not be afraid of their faces, for I'm with you. So the Lord is actually comforting. He's bringing... Uh, he's assuring him of his presence. There is purpose. He's saying, okay, I'm putting my words in your mouth, Jeremiah, so that you can speak out, you will establish, you will uproot, um, you will build, and you will tear down and all that. So there is you know, purpose, and he's kind of commissioning Jeremiah. But he's also encouraging him. And the prophetic word comes, and he's, you know, don't be afraid of their faces. You know, don't look, Don't look down upon yourself because you are young and so on. So... There is. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. Right? Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and the future. So these are words which assure us of God's heart, His character and nature, bringing this very thing. All right. Yes, there is judgment, because there is the goodness and the severity of God, and, and that is something that we see as well. That is also part of the prophetic. Right? So, which means, you know, God's heart, you know, God's dis God's displeasure, or God saying that, hey, I'm angry with this. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not pleased with this. Like Nathan did. Nathan brought that, you know, that word uh, to David, saying, God is not pleased. You know, this is what you did. So there is correction, exposing somebody's wrong, right, in a very personal way, but also in a way that brought change. Right, he repented. So, so all that. Is a God's heart. And also, you know, when it comes to New Testament, we see that on the cross, God actually poured out the wrath on Jesus so that we can walk free of that. We can walk in grace. We can not walk in condemnation, but walk in the freedom of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, right? We so so that is a that is a full picture of it. So um, well, will God speak? Correction, yes, he will do. But all correction is also redemptive in nature. To bring back. Why does God want to correct? Because he doesn't want you to get destroyed. He doesn't want you to experience pain and loss. He wants you to come back to his heart. So it's redemptive in nature, the very correction that he brings. You know, the Ten Commandments, redemptive in nature. Why? Because God does not want us to go away. God does not want us to get trapped fall into sin and bondage and doesn't want to destroy us. Uh, so therefore, it's redemptive. It's like a safety net, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Right. Right. So we see all these judgments that are pronounced and um, on the wicked um, and we see you know uh, what, what, which verse did you say ezekiel 6 is it yeah uh, turn your set your face and prophesy again six verses one and two right yeah so 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 this is like see god cannot ignore evil god cannot ignore sin and there is a consequence for it and god reveals that but there is also an outcome which happens because of repentance so God revealed, okay, hey, Jonah, go and prophesy. This is what it is, you know, three days, and then 
you know, you're going to experience it. But then people repented in sackcloth and ashes and, you know, and then God spared. So as, as true as this is, yes, there is the righteousness of God. There is the severity of God uh, and so on. There is also God's compassion and, uh, you know, especially when people repent and turn from their ways. Okay. Um, okay, I just see a comment here. All can prophesy based on their thirst and interest in that gift. Yeah, so we need to pursue, we need to desire the gift. Okay, so that's something that we see. But prior to that, it must be God's will, right? Even before we, if it's not God's will, and no, no matter how much we, we, you know, desire it, it's not going to happen. But we need to understand that it is God's will. It is God's will for everyone to be a spokesperson for Him. Right? You're basically being a spokesperson. You know, God revealing His heart, speaking His heart and mind to us, and we are receiving it. So we are be being spokespeople for God. Right? Another thing that we can look at is the, what the Lord Jesus said. You know, He said, my sheep hear my voice. They know me, they hear my voice. He's talking about everyone you know, who, who calls Him as the shepherd. He's talking about the people right, who consider Jesus as their Lord and as their shepherd. So says, my sheep know me, they hear my voice, they follow me. Which means that as sheep, we have been designed to hear the voice of God. And prophecy is nothing but hearing and obeying or hearing and communicating what God is saying right? in a simple way. right? So all can prophesy. Right? So... That is something that we see. So therefore, prophetic worship is very relevant, and it's it's something you know for all believers. So all can prophesy. Okay, let's look at what prophecy. You know, how do we hear God? How do we receive this prophetic word? Right. So, um, first of all, you know, it could be an impression in our heart. What is an impression? Have you all put thumb impression? Right. Thumb impression, which means that you know you. Put it, there's an ink pad, you put your thumb, and then there is an, you know, you put your impression there, right? You just press, and so there's some force, you press, and then impress, and there's impression happens, right? So we receive God's word through an impression. God speaks to us through an impression in our spirit, right? It could be something that is on our heart. It can be something that is emphasized to us. Right? So uh, sometimes we, uh, when we think of prophecy, we are thinking of something spectacular, right? We are thinking of a very vision. And can God speak like that? Yes. We have a powerful encounter, and God's speaking, and we, are, and we are listening, and we are hearing, and can God speak? Of course, God can, and God still does. Right? We have this powerful encounter. But also God speaks in other ways where we see Scripture it came into someone's heart that they should do it. Moses, right? It came into his heart that he should actually set free his brethren. It came into his heart. Nehemiah, it came into his heart. Right? He had this whole thing of, hey, I need to do something about it. And that's what, that was a desire that God put in them. Right? So it can be an impression. Right? It can be something that is it's like somebody leaning and this thought is not leaving us. It's like it's it's deep within. Okay? So it could be an impression. It could be a flash of information. Now, you know, there is scripture for all this, and you can actually study it when you do, you know, the whole course on the prophetic. It could be a flash of information, like right? uh, which means that you know there is it just an illumination in your inner man. You know, something that something something that could be visible also. Right? You see, for example, you could see a scripture reference, or you could, you could see a word visible, visual. Right? You could see that as well. So it could be a flash of information in our spirit. It could be a quickening of, of scripture. You know, you suddenly you are you know in your spirit you are feeling or you are sensing this scripture verse coming to you. Right? The scripture was over and over and over again. What is God saying? He's actually communicating that scripture. Maybe it's a promise. Maybe it's uh, something to guide. And it's a timely rhema word that is coming to our spirit. So it could be a 
quickening of scripture to our spirit right um, it could be a knowing on the inside it could be a knowing on this inside meaning that hey this is what i'm supposed to do this is what i'm this decision is what i'm supposed to take etc right it could be a word it could be a sentence it could be a paragraph it could be a picture it could sometimes it could even be a physical sensation right like a mantle like a blanket an assurance of god right you know that okay god has said god has spoken right so god speaks in all these any any doubts um yeah, just be there. yeah yeah okay sure okay so god speaks in all these ways it could be a uh, you know it could be a picture it could be a word it could be a sentence it could be a uh, you know something that god puts in our heart right so we need to be sensitive to receive that right so we are just looking at okay this is what prophecy this is how we receive it if we have other ideas you know of it could all only be spectacular it could only be you know something that is so so um, you know like a powerful encounter well we could be missing out on all the other ways that god speaks to our heart right so if we if we just look for the spectacular we could just miss out on the significant and the supernatural ways in which god speaks to us okay okay we'll take a break and then we'll come back later.